Good evening, everybody. Uh, we welcome you to this uh, uh, PKC uh, webinar. Uh, we've been having this every Saturday and also this Saturday we're having it. Uh, we apologize for a little bit of mix up with the timings. Uh, we had announced seven, but now it's eight o'clock. Uh, I'm sure all of you are tuned in to an exciting evening. And uh, we are very happy to have with us Dr. Christian Hoser and Professor Christian Fink. Uh, they need no introduction. Uh, they have been a lot of. They have been doing great work in ACLs, and especially today, they are going to speak to us on the quadriceps tendon. You know, Dr. Christian will speak on the quadriceps tendon harvest technique, and then we have the new gold by the uh, Professor Christian Fink. Then the quadriceps tendon PCL by Dr. Sachin, who will give a talk on that, and then quadriceps tendon for MPFL reconstruction. I think it's a uh, you know, the quadriceps tendon is something which we are all excited about and we want to know more because we don't use it as much as it actually can be used. It has a great potential. So take you further. I want to request uh, Dr. Sachin Tapaswi to uh, introduce once again uh, our light speakers. Over to Thank, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Yeah, thank you, Parak. Can you hear me well now? Very well. Very audible. Okay. So friends, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you for this uh, webinar. Apologies again for changing the 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Actually, I think uh, too much of uh, isolation and too much of uh, lockdown has uh, affected our thinking capacity, really. No, I'm just joking. So it's a great pleasure to welcome two great friends. These two are excellent uh, friends for India. They have been with us previously on our previous editions of Pune Knee Course. And truly, both of them are single-handedly responsible for pioneering the quadriceps tendon in various knee reconstructions. So welcome from the whole organizing team of Pune Knee Course, uh, the new dates of which are 5, 6, and 7 November of this year. So Dr. Fink and Dr. Hoser, the two Christians, uh, if I can say so, they come from this very lovely city of uh, Innsbruck in Austria, and both of them are partners and run this very famous sports and injury prevention and arthritis center called as Gelen Punkt. So uh, they would be very happy to welcome all of you to their center, which is in Innsbruck in Austria. And today's agenda will go through these four talks as I've outlined. And of course, please keep pouring your questions in as always. Uh, Dr. Christian Fink and Dr. Christian Hoser would be more than happy to share their experience and <clears throat> take care of most of any queries that we may have. So I'm going to stop my, my screen share now and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Christian Hoser for his first talk wherein he's going to be discussing as to how do we harvest the perfect quad tendon graft. All yours, Dr. Christian Hoser. Thank you so very much for joining us. Um, may I start with saying thank you that you give us the option to be with you tonight, this evening. Um, and we will try to present to you our experience with quadriceps tendon and how we learned to use it as our major graft. We Quadriceps tendon anatomy has been described long ago. It was a Swiss guy, Hans Uli Stäubli, who described the length, the width, and the thickness of the quadriceps tendon. It was clear from there that the measures of the quadriceps tendon are absolutely appropriate for being used as a graft for several purposes. Now you see here their publication, another one by Seroganis from the US in 2013, where they confirmed what, what was already seen uh, previously. Quadriceps tendon, as I said, was known as a great graft for the ACL and the PCL for reconstruction in primary and revision. But what always uh, was for a lot of surgeons, a problem was the harvest, which is supposed to be more difficult. And of course, a cosmesis that is less attractive than even and especially compared to hamstring tendon. Now, this is historically spoken or historically showed the, uh, the classical longitudinal incision on the proximal pole of the patella 
reaching proximal from there with the tendon being cut out, you may say, or the graft being cut out out of the quadriceps tendon. But this leaves scars in beautiful young girls like this, which are not attractive. And this led Christian Fink, especially my to the idea, let's find another way of harvesting this graft, this tendon to be more appropriate for modern day use. Now he with colleagues developed this technique. It's a transverse incision in the proximal pole of the patella where we dissect down to the tendon itself. No bump, there is no fat tissue there, by the way, which is important even in people that are not super slim, you will not find any fat tissue between the skin and the tendon there. And then we use this specially designed double and double knife as a first one and the tendon separator as a second one to cut out the appropriate width of the tendon that we need for the special purpose. Here in this uh, uh, photos, you see the double knife of 10 millimeters. There is options from eight to 12. And you see the tendon separator, the one on the right, with a width of five millimeters so that you get a graft of 10 millimeter width and five millimeter thickness of the quadriceps. Then the third instrument, which was specially designed, was one to cut tendon proximally underneath the skin, which you, you can't reach this position, of course, other than with this tendon cutter. And the tendon cutter lets you reach into the tendon up to 110 millimeters. So you can really slide up your tendon cutter as far as you need. You don't need 110 millimeters for ACL and PCL, but for an MPFL and a bigger patient, you do want a longer graft. And there's the first option that we show here, the quadriceps tendon with a bone block. You have to use an oscillating saw to have it from the proximal patella because the bone there is very hard. And if you are used to harvesting from the patella tendon, you know that harvesting there is also meticulous, but it's a little bit easier than even harvesting here because the bone is harder here. So the oscillating saw is absolutely necessary. So in this lower right picture, don't use the osteotome for these cuts. First cuts are not to be made with an osteotome. You will split the patella. Third cut, which has to be made in the back. This is now the uh, next option to use the quadriceps tendon without the bone block. There, it's technically easier to harvest it. And you see that we use a part of the tendon that is also already overlying the patella, which um, is shown here. And in the next picture, you see why we do this, because we like to flip around this periodical part of the quadriceps tendon like this, hold it in, and then be able to make a nice leading edge slide in easily into the tunnel you will prepare. This is an arthroscopic or using the endoscope to show what the defect looks like. You see the floor of the defect, you see the sidewall of the defect, and you also see here that we do not cut into the joint. I would say that in about 70 to 80 percent of all cases, we do not open the joint at all. In 20 to 30 percent of the cases, you do open the joint. You can hold it nice and here you will not have a problem with creating pressure in the joint and doing a normal arthroscopy and normal ACL reconstruction after that. Now, why is this shape of the graph that I have shown to you now something that has, very, has been very intriguing to us? Robert Kielski from Warsaw has shown us a very new and nice concept of anatomy of the ACL. And he, as you may already know, has shown us that the ACL is not a round structure, it seems to be a ribbon-like, very flat structure. Now, this is origin from the femur. We see that using a flat tendon to reconstruct this flat ACL does make sense. So that's something that we developed and we are using regularly in our, situ in our patients. A round graft created out of this bone block, a flat graft created out of this bone block has certain differences. Number one, the square diameter of a seven millimeter round graft is equal 
to a square diameter of an eight by five millimeter rectangular graph with a millimeters squared. I have shown here the measures that can be compared between round and rectangular graphs. What does the shape of the graph, meaning a rectangular graph, do in motion? And you see that the fibers of this graph have a zero degree of knee flexion. It is a parallel one, which is actually the one that the ACL has. And it twists like it should twist or well, like the ACL, the nat natural ACL does twist when we flex the knee to 135 degrees. This looks very nice, and we think that the potential advantage is there, and we have shown that it can even be measured. Now, another aspect which is important to us is the diffusion length in a graph that is round, as opposed to a graph that is rectangular, is massively different. It's minus less than 40, about half the distance in a rectangular graph as opposed to a round graph. And this does play a role in the biology of the graph, how it is nourished, how it can soak in, how it can uh, be um, biologically incorporated. So that's another advantage that we think is present with a flat graph. Now we show you a video that gives you an impression how we do this harvest and the ACL reconstruction. As I have alluded already, our goal is to make angular very close to nature ACL graft, which twists in knee flexion. You see now in a cadaver, a harvest situation with a transverse incision on the proximal pole of the patella. Then we use the double knife as the first knife to make 10 millimeter, two cuts separated 10 millimeters that creates the first separation of the tendon. You see the length gauge on the handle. Then the second knife is a tendon separator, in this situation, five millimeters thick. That is inserted like this, pushed proximally, we should push to the surface of the tendon, meaning back, and then the tendon cutter is inserted, pushed proximally. And then, the graft can be pulled out subcutaneously and the dissection can be followed on to the patella. Now here it is shown how to use the oscillating saw for the, third, for the three cuts that I have alluded to. Or to use the knife to dissect this periosteal part of the extensor apparatus, say the following fibers of the quadriceps tendon above the patella, which makes it possible to fold it in like this and create a nice leading edge for the graft. Now then we close the tendon defect, which creates the surface of the tendon, which has the potential to regenerate fully. Now this is the intraarticular situation where we have put in our guide pin on the femur, and we engage the 4.5 millimeter drill intraarticularly, drill a 4.5 millimeter hole, and then we use these rasps with eight by five millimeters or nine by five millimeters to create this rectangular shaped tunnel on the origin of the ACL in the femur, driven in to 20, 25 millimeters, so that it, even a little more here. Then we use a dilator, which dilates the tunnel to the appropriate size. And a very similar thing we do on the tibia with a guide pin first, and the second guide pin, which is 
interior to the first one, which should mimic the insertion area of the ACL on the tibia. And then we use the same instruments as on the femur to create a rectangular tunnel on the tibia as well. Now, this is the graph. You see here the version with a bone block, a flat bone block, nine by five millimeters with the endo button attached to it. And now already the intraarticular situation. Here, of course, you have to take care that the bone block has to be orientated or rotated in the correct way so that it can slide into the proximal tunnel nicely as it is slid in now. Again, what we think is a big advantage for the ACL reconstruction as we do it. Here you see a picture from a living patient with the ACL graft in place. It engages in the intraarticular notch. Coming down from the femoral insertion. The next picture shows you a graft which shows a nice synovialization six months after surgery and it looks like a biologically nicely incorporated graph. Now there is another advantage of this technique in situations where the revision comes into play. You see here how small the defect or the tunnel is in the femur compared round to rectangular. You see a clinical result of a patient with harvest of the quadriceps tendon and the postoperative clinical result in both maximum flexion and extension. And another option for the quadriceps tendon is the pediatric ACL. We have these very small young patients with functional instability of the knee. We are always wary of what we should do to them, but quite a few of them need a reconstruction. Not happy unreconstructed. And here the technique is shown where in this little patient the transverse incision is performed and the tendon is harvested the same way as in an adult patient. And here, of course, we do a graft without a bone block, bring it in transepiphysially in a technique that shows on the X-ray like this to reconstruct the ACL in the pediatric. Now the revision ACL, where the big advantage of the smaller dimension of the rectangular would be very tricky to place a round tunnel superior to this wrongly placed tunnel in this position. But, but with this rectangular situation, rectangular um, bone tunnel, it is very often possible to do a single stage revision safely and get a firm grip of the graft on the femur. Whereas in, with a round tunnel, we would probably opt for a two-stage revision and fill up the round bone tunnel from the primary operation first and do it in a second stage. Clinical picture intraoperatively, the rectangular tunnel behind the previous round tunnel, and on CT, the rectangular tunnel behind the previous round tunnel. Really, that's actually how we started with the quadriceps tendon and how we felt that this is a good graph than only a revision situation. Now, in conclusion, I may say that the quadriceps tendon is a reliable technique for ACL reconstruction, primary and revision situations. It has a low harvest site mobility and shows good clinical results. And it has two options, the bone block and the soft tissue. Option. Here you see the publication. Here you see a nice group, small group of people from all around the world, I may say, uh, 
the International Quadriceps Tendon Interest Group that had its first meeting in Innsbruck and was supposed to have its second meeting in these days in, uh, in Oslo. It had to be post reasons that we know. Of the IQTI, thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, thank you, Christian. Uh, that was uh, a really nice presentation. We actually lost your voice a couple of times. So, um, any questions from the panel and any questions coming from uh, the uh, from the participants? More than welcome. There's uh, one question which I... has come up, Sachin. Yes. So, Dr. Finch, excellent talk. Uh, the incision which you showed was a transverse incision. So the question is, why not take a vertical incision which will actually show you uh, more part of the tendon as well as more of the patella? So why a transverse incision and why not vertical? Yes. One word. Sorry, we could yes. hear you. So the, the main reason for doing it transverse is a cosmetical reason. Uh -huh. Okay, so any disadvantage by doing a vertical incision? We think that it's that there's a, a major difference. It's a major difference. Well, now, if you have a revision patient, a revision patient does not care about his incision. A revision patient wants a stable knee, but a primary okay. patient does care about his cosmesis of his incision. So we think uh, the acceptance is much higher than uh, with with longitudinal incision in our hands. Okay, okay. there's another yeah. question that's come up. When you harvest a bone block for a primary ACL, correct? So do we take the bone block to the femur or to the tibia? And if so, why? We use the bone block on the femoral side nearly all of the times. Um, there has been some situations where we would use the bone block on the tibial side if there was a bone defect in a, in a uh, situation where we would do a revision and uh, we would uh, like to fill up a bigger bone tunnel on the, on the tibia and uh, have an easier situation on the femur where it does not need a bone. So then you can reverse it. But uh, most of the times we use the bone block on the top, meaning on the femur. Okay. Dr. Anshu has a question. Anshu, can you come in with a question, please? Yeah. So my question is, what is or what are the conditions or uh, scenarios where you would not harvest a QT? Size okay. of the patient, size of the tendon on MR. What are the situations yeah. where you would not choose a QT? We do not measure the tendon pre-op on, on MR. We are very um, happy with the situations, meaning with a, with a volume that we can get from the patients. What can happen is if you have a thin, thin quadriceps tendon to start with, that you do take a full thickness graft, which is what most people, what most surgeons do anyway when they do an open harvest. So we do have some patients where we do get a full thickness graft uh, when it's thin, but we are not aware of that we don't get a sufficient graft at all. Uh, certainly things happen when you do a bad job and you don't harvest the proper graft. It does happen very rarely, but it does. Then you would have to go, go to another graft source on the knee, but that's very rare. It's very reliable source of graft in our hands. But there is, uh, uh, there is situations where we, where we were, where we are uh, hesitative of harvesting, that is a, patella bi a bipartite patella, where we would uh, not harvest the bone, but still would harvest the uh, um, tendinous part of the quadriceps tendon. And let me think if there's other situations where we are sort of not um, in, in male patients at the age of 60, 65, where we do have some that need an ACL reconstruction. Those are the ones that rupture the quadriceps tendon um, as we know from the clinical setting, there we think about harvesting the tendon sometimes if they're a little heavier, then we would not harvest the tendon from there because if he has a quadriceps tendon, one may say, okay, you have, you should know that they are prone to rupturing the quadriceps tendon anyway. Okay, so Dr. Nilesh has a question. Nilesh, can you come with your question, please? Right, uh, so what I wanted to ask is that when to get the maximum length of the quadriceps tendon, would you like to err on the lateral side or the medial side when you're harvesting the tendon? Absolutely important question. 
compared to the lateral side. So in the in the studies that have they say you should be at 61.5 percent from medial to lateral. So a little bit more lateral than central when you want. I think the audio is switched. Um, when we do not need super long. Yes, Ashok. A long graph. Yeah, Christian. Christian, one second. Your uh, yeah. Can you just change the audio? Yeah. Is that better? Yeah, yeah, that's smart, but that's, that's smart, perfect. Yeah, yeah. When, when you do not need a super long graft, then you just orient yourself on the fibers of the vastus medialis entering the quadriceps tendon. So you look in, you see where the vastus medialis fibers enter, and that's your medial cut. And then your lateral cut is uh, determined by that. Right. If you need a graft that is very long, as I've alluded to in the, in the MPFL situation, you do need that. You really look in and you follow the fibers of the rectus femoris, which are the longest ones, obviously. Yes. And then you incise with a double knife exactly where these fibers are visible, leading very far proximal. Well done. Okay. So uh, there are a couple of questions which are also coming on, you know, what is the incidence of weakness of the quadriceps after uh, having uh, harvested the quad tendon? So I'm not so sure whether... Uh, uh, Professor Fink is going to cover that in his talk, or would you be happy to answer it right now? I think he will. Do I, do I, did, I, uh, did I understand correctly? If there is a weakness in the tendon... No, no, no. no, no sorry, sorry. Um, my bad. If we harvest the quadriceps tendon, are we likely to cause weakness in the quadriceps post-operatively, post-harvest? He will allude to that in his talk. Perfect. So now there's uh, Dr. Sandeep Biraris wants to ask a question. Sandeep, can you come in with a question, please? And then maybe we'll take uh, further questions after Professor Fink's uh, talk. Sandeep, please yeah, come uh, in with a question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Professor Fink, in revision cases of ACL, what type of fixation is preferred on femoral side? Um, we are using extracortical fixation in every single case. Perfect. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hoser. Uh, we'll move on to the next talk now. Uh, we have almost about 25 more questions coming up uh, concerning the quad tendon and the ACL. So once we finish with uh, Professor Fink's talk, we'll take all these questions again. We'll come from my side. We just uh, switch uh, one second. Okay. Okay. So welcome, welcome to India. So I will talk a little bit uh, on the different graft sources we have and uh, maybe the situation which graft is for, for which patient. So these are my disclosures. I get uh, product royalties from Karl Storz for developing this instrumentation. When we look at uh, the evolution of ACL reconstruction, we have, uh, you know, these different graft options. And when we started our training in the 90s, patella tendon was by far the most common uh, transplant. And then in about 2000, the hamstring came along. And then slowly seeing some issues with the hamstring or discussion about higher re rupture rate. And then in about 2000, at least in Europe, quad tendon uh, came along and was uh, used more and more. This is actually very well represented in the literature when you look over the last years that the amount of quad tendons uh, publications have been increased uh, by every year. So now I'd like to compare the different graphs um, with uh, for different parameters and uh, I will start with biomechanics the different grafts meaning patella tendon hamstring and quad tendon and when it comes to biomechanics at time zero all the graft sources we use we can see they a, a approximate or almost superside the natural ACL so there's no real advantage of any of the graft when we look at pure strength at uh, time zero when we look at graft incorporation, we can see that bone incorporates faster than soft tissue. And we know from patella tendon 
that this is definitely an advantage of this tendon. When you have a bone block on the end, you've got a quicker graft incorporation. So this is an advantage for any bone, uh, bone graft, which uh, you know you can since you can use the, the quad tendon with the bone block. This is definitely an, an advantage, an advantage uh, over over the over the uh, hamstrings, for example. When we look at laxity and compare different studies, relation of the pivot shift or the Lachman test, we can, where are different studies, huge uh, systematic reviews. And here in this study from 2019 by Shakman et Trey, you see there is no difference, no significant difference with respect to the Lachman test between hamstring, quad tendon, and uh, BTB. When we look at the pivot shift, again, in this study, no significant difference between the grafts. However, there are some other studies. Again, this is a systematic review showing there is some difference. There are more negative, negative Lachmann tests uh, in the quad tendon groups compared to the hamstring groups. Pivot shift is about similar. So there is some evidence that maybe patellar tendon as well as quad tendon have a slight advantage over the hamstrings when it comes to laxity. So if you look at this in the compare the three grafts, maybe there's a slight advantage of these two grafts over the, the hamstring compared to laxity. Tie strength, this is also an interesting aspect. He, see here in this multi-center study, three out of seven studies found the significant weakening of the hamstrings after you harvest the hamstring graft. So this is, this is some other studies did not find this, but, but uh, three studies found the pure, uh, but pure testing on flexion. We know if you harvest a hamstring, uh, if you would test internal rotation, there would be a side-to-side -side difference because these are the main internal rotators. So there may be a, a strength difference. When we compare quad tendon versus hamstring with respect to muscle recovery, there's, in the end, there is no difference between those groups. We looked at a study our, on our patients and you can see when you harvest the quad tendon that of course the uh, extensor strength is impaired initially, but then it's coming up and it can recover fully. Whereas as we know, when you miss the hamstrings, you might not recover fully, but uh, you can even after, after quad tendon harvest, you can fully recover your strength and it's a matter of training and it's not as a matter of the graft harvesting. So it's full recovery is, is possible. So from the strength part, I think uh, uh, there is an advantage of patellar tendon and quad because we know that even if it's maybe hard and training is hard, you can fully recover it. Whereas if you lose a muscle, you might not recover flexor strength or internal rotator strength fully. When we look at subjective outcome with respect to PROMS, comparing the different graphs, there is absolutely no difference in this big series. So there's no difference between uh, patellar tendon and hamstring and quad tendon uh, in almost none of the studies also in our, in, our, in our studies. So you see no difference, no significant difference with respect to PROM. So subjectively, they're all about very, very similar. When we look at donor site mobility, this was definitely a downside of BTB represented in almost all the studies. So BTB being a great graft with great strength, uh, it has more morbidity compared to either hamstring or quad tendon. When we look at anterior knee pain and kneeling pain, kneeling pain especially, so if you have a kneeling occupation, patellar tendon is definitely not the graft choice, whereas you can very safely use uh, hamstring or use the quad tendon graft for this, uh, for this patient group. So from morbidity, we think there is an advantage here. There's one really disadvantage of the uh, patellar tendon graft. When it comes to cosmesis, we were talking about this. Uh, it has been a downside for a long time to make this big incision superior in the tie and also patella tendon may have some disadvantage cosmetically compared to hamstring graft. And as you say, in a primary situation, cosmesis, I, we think do play a role, but as we said, you can harvest it uh, through uh, minimal invasive ways, even the quad, even the patella tendon you can theoretically harvest harvest with a small incision or two transverse incision. And uh, we see the, the transverse incision, they, they really heal very nicely here on the tibia. So, so 
there is definitely a, let's say, maybe a slight disadvantage of the of the patella tendon with respect to cosmesis, but uh, not for the other graft. Atrosis, I think this is an interesting fact. And here we have to say that we do not have the same amount of long-term data for quad tendon. When we compare patella tendon to hamstrings, there seem to be an advantage of the hamstrings with respect to a lower rate of development of uh, atrosis in these patients. Re-rupture rates, and this I think is a very important fact when you look at our patients, is not just the subjective outcome, objective outcome, also the risk of re-rupture. And when you pull different studies again, this is the average re-rupture rate of an average population. So we see patella tendon and quad and about similar hamstring tendon, uh, just a little bit higher. There was a very concerning study showing exactly the opposite, which came out uh, recently. Uh, from Denmark, from Martin Lin, from a registry data. And in his registry data, opposite to all the published information before, quad tendon had a higher re-rupture rate compared to patella tendon and even compared to hamstrings. When uh, Martin Lind looked at this more closely, they could actually find out that the reason was they had four centers and the high revision rate in the registry were came out of four centers which had revision rates of 10 to 20 percent and it was for four centers of very low volume surgeons so in the high volume departments they do greater than 100 procedures of reconstruction a year we actually saw that the revision rate was lower compared to all the other crafts so you have to be careful with uh, registry data and look at them very carefully they can see that it's, it, it is a matter of uh, there is a learning curve for sure and I think it's in any procedure, you have to do a few to get a good result. Our practice, when you look over the years, we started out with mostly hamstrings and then increased patella tendon for our primaries and also increased the volume of ACLs. Um, accordingly, we do about uh, 300 ACLs and you see that uh, quad tendon became the number one uh, clearly in, in uh, 2017 and now going on 2019. When we look at our own graft and our revision rates, and this is a study which was just accepted two weeks ago in American Journal of Sports Medicine, it will come out soon. Again, if you look at the overall revision rates, and this is comparing data from our database of 800 patients, 200 hamstrings, 200 quad tendons, and about 650 hamstrings, you see that the overall revision rate of the, uh, is about 4.3, quad tendon 2.8, hamstrings 4.9, the contralateral revision, uh, contralateral rupture rate, which I think is very important because that tells you that your patient really went back to sports, went back to their activity. It's about 2.3 in, in, in both of these groups. But when you look at high active patients, and these are patients uh, of a technical activity level greater than six, then you see suddenly a difference between the two graphs and you get a significantly higher revision rate of the hamstrings compared to the quad tendon when you increase the activity of the patient. So here, just in comparison, this is the, the quad tendon in high active patients compared to quad tendon in less active patients. And in same in hamstrings, if you have high active patients, you have a significantly higher revision rate here compared to the contralateral side. Whereas as soon as you lower your activity, graft does not matter as much as it, 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 it has been before. So re-rupture rate, we maybe have a slight advantage of, of uh, the patella tendon and quad tendon. So if we zoom up, we have a very close run up and we see the quad tendon for sure uh, has its standing compared to the other graft and maybe for some patient has some, some advantages. One graft, as we know, may not fit for all patient situations. So there are patients who benefit from one or the other graft. And I think what we have to do is an individualized type of surgery to really take all the aspects in account. So if you have this patient, a young female athlete uh, with valgus alignment in a high risk sport, 16 years is the, probably the highest risk patient. Uh, if you want to do a patella tendon, well, the mobility in this girl is certainly high. A hamstring, if you see this valgus alignment, uh, you would not necessarily like to take. 
So here, I think a quad tendon is a, a very good solution. So in summary, is it the new gold standard? I do not know, but we do know that it has good anatomical, biomechanical, and clinical, as well as cosmetical outcomes. We do not have the long-term data, which we have for the other graft. And we know that not every graft fits for every patient. We, as a knee surgeon, I think we have to be familiar with all the grafts available. Again, IQTI, if you're interested, go to this website, you find everything what's written on quad tendon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. That was really great. And uh, we have a couple of questions coming up again. So when we're using, uh, uh, when we're using the quad tendon graft for primary ACL and you've harvested the bone plug, so why do we use suspensory fixation on the femur? Why can't we use just an interference screw on the femur? Any specific reason why? Uh, first of all, of course, you can use a screw if you like to use a screw in your, in, in your patients. I stopped using screws intraarticularly a long time ago. And uh, it was because at one situation, I cut a graft when I put in the screw. And this put an end to my usage of interference screws intraarticularly. But if you're familiar with it, and if you use, if you harvest it with a bone block or even as a soft tissue graft, if you're happy with screw fixation, of course you can uh, use a screw fixation for the quad tendon as well. But that's personal preference. Okay, and Nilesh, you have a question here? You need to unmute yourself, Nilesh, please. Apologies. So Professor, what I wanted to know here is, in a revision setting, if the prior surgery has been done with a BTB graft, are we safe enough to harvest the CQT with a bone plug? That is my first question. And my second question is, in a multi-leg setting, are we at a higher risk of the extensor mechanism disrupting if you're harvesting a CQT along with the BTB in the same setting? First of all, yes, you should be careful if there has been a pre-harvest of a bone block of the patella. I like to do a CT scan. Most of the time you can, well, you can always use quad tendon as a soft tissue graft. Okay. And if, uh, if there is a small, if there's a big enough bridge, I think I have done it. You can also use a bone block from the patella, but you have to be very careful. And I like to see a CT scan and in case I, I am in doubt, I either use a soft tissue graft or I go to the contralateral side. Right. In, in, in multi-leak surgery to harvest, actually, I think I have never done it to harvest the patellar tendon and the quad tendon on the same knee for a multi-leak situation. I think so far I have never done this. I, 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 I just, uh, in this case, I harvest, it, harvest the quad tendon from the contralateral side if I need it. Right, right, yeah. thank you. Okay, so uh, there, was a, there were a lot of questions on after harvesting a quad tendon graft, do you have to modify your rehab program? And are you at risk of getting weakness of the quads post quad tendon harvest? Uh, in fact, I mean, the most important, I think, after any ACL construction is to focus on active extension to get the quad firing patterns back. We have patients, even if you harvest a hamstring, they have a tough time to fire their quads. But if you focus on extension and quad, uh, and quad activation, we do not see a problem. Actually, they do have pain for the first two, three days, but the harvest side mobility uh, is extremely low. And uh, even compared to hamstring, it's extremely low. So we, we do not see the problem. We see that when you measure strengths, you see that in fact, it takes a little bit longer for the quad strength to recover compared to hamstrings. But actually what you get is a higher hamstring to quad ratio, which we think may be, bene may be beneficial for the initial parts of rehabilitation. So you have your, your, your hamstrings are protective and they're firing at full, at full force. And uh, the quad is a little bit impaired, but it comes back later. But the most important is I think in starting from immediate post-op, you have to focus on extension and quad firing patterns. That's the key. Okay, the next question is that when we harvest a quad tendon graft for a primary ACL, do you harvest the full thickness of the tendon or do you harvest only the partial thickness of uh, the tendon? Yeah, we, we, as I say, we try, to, we try to harvest 
a, a partial thickness graft. As uh, Christian uh, said before, sometimes it happens that you can actually go all the way through, especially if you have got a thin tendon in a maybe tiny person, which we do not think is a problem, but we aim to just leave a small layer of a quad tendon in the center and in the center there. This is the ideal situation. And uh, we always close the, 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 the harvest side defect. So what happens if the joint gets open and, uh, you know, the fluid leaks out? I mean, what happens if you need to sort of close the arthrotomy formally? Will that lead to any problems? No, we, you, can actually, you can actually close it very well. Even if you use a small incision, you have to use a long langer back retractor. You have to use a small needle and you can really close the defect up all the way. And then what we do is actually we take a swap and, and, uh, and uh, basically we put the tamponade in the incision. So we just put a swap in the incision to tamponade the, the bleeding for one thing, but also you can tamponade some, some, some leakage if you have. But it's so far over what we are overlooking now about 700 uh, quad tendon reconstructions. And uh, we hadn't had to stop one because of a, a leakage problem. Okay, so can we use a normal uh, dilator for the femoral drill, for the, uh, for the femoral tunnel? Or is it necessary to make it no. rectangular or no. can we just use it uh, like a round no, circle? No, no, no. It's absolutely not necessary. You can do a round tunnel, you can do a round tunnel. It's just the flat maybe has some, uh, some, some advantages in a revision situation, but it, you can absolutely use, use a round tunnels. So that is not that is not a problem. You don't have to change. You don't have to change your technique when you start using quadriceps tendon. Yeah. So to uh, all the viewers, you can keep pouring your questions in. I'm probably going to take a couple of questions more before we move on to the next talk. Um, well, the next question that's come up is that what is the infection rate after doing a quad tendon harvest? Is it uh, any different from hamstrings or more than tendon bone? Well. What, what I can tell is I think the biggest change in infection rate came through the usage of vancomycin. So okay. to wrap your graft into vancomycin really reduces your infection rate almost to zero. And I do not, I, 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 I think this is regardless of the graft. So we do not see more infections uh, with the graft. And I have to say with, since we use vancomycin, our infection rate from which was uh, below 1% went almost down to zero. Okay. The next question is that if you're doing a concomitant ACL with PCL, where would your quad tendon graft go to? Would it go to the PCL or would it go to the ACL? <laughs> I, I think you can do it both ways. Uh, I, to, for me, it would go to the PCL. PCL, of, uh, uh, I think it's the stronger graft and I would try to put the stronger graft to the PCL in this case. Okay. And if uh, some of the, uh, some of the graft remains open in the sense, you know, you've closed the arthrotomy, but yeah. at the apex proximally, mm -hmm. a small area still stays open. Will it cause any weakness? No, we have, we have, we have, we have not, you have not seen it. Uh, I have seen a picture of a friend of mine who, who took a very long graft in a, a short patient. And uh, he actually went into the rectus muscle and he got some retraction there. Uh, you, as you see it in a muscle rupture, I would say, you know, we know that you cannot, even in a big muscle ruptures in soccer players, if you have this situation, it doesn't look nice cosmetically, but it does not, in fact, weaken the, weaken the, the, the muscle if you, if you train. So it can compensate. But this only happens, and I've seen it once, only happens when you go very far up and go into the muscle, in, in the rectus muscle insertion, it can, it can retract. Okay. So I think Parak, should we go on to the next talk? Because uh, yes. we have, there are, I think, about another couple of questions that have come up. I'll just quickly ask one while uh, Dr. Fink uh, stops his screen sharing and I put up my screen up. So um, the, do you need to use, what happens if you use a tonique during harvesting? Does it cause any problems? So, sorry, can you? If, if we use a tonique, yeah, yeah. yeah, will it cause any problems because the quadriceps will get impaled in the same? No, we, we always, in fact, we always use a tourniquet, so we haven't seen any problems. So we all do our, we do our reconstructions with tourniquets, so no. Okay, right. So uh, we'll move on to the third talk. I'll be speaking on the role of the quad tendon for 
PCL reconstructions. And uh, I think it's really important for us to quickly look at the anatomy of the PCL because that's where the importance of this very beautiful graft comes into play. So the PCL femoral footprint is a large footprint. As we all are aware, the footprint extends from the roof of the nostril. It's flush with the articular surface and the length of the PCL footprint in the average Indian male is close to anywhere between 25 to 30 millimeters in length. The posterior extent of the PCL is variable. It extends up to seven o'clock in the left knee and up to five o'clock in the right knee, which means that on the femoral side, you require a very large uh, sort of footprint of collagen if you want to reconstruct all the PCL fibers adequately. So I think this is one of the most important take home messages when we are planning to do any form of PCL surgery. On the other hand, uh, if you look at the tibial side, the tibial side is a sort of a small concentrated insertion point, which is in a small depression, which is below the tibial plateau and is almost about a centimeter below the joint line as what you can see from this arthroscopic uh, demonstration here where the scope is in the posterior lateral uh, portal and the visinger rod is coming through the posterior medial portal, which is showing the insertion point of the PCL. So the ideal graft for a PCL reconstruction has always been a matter of debate. But what is really important is that when we're doing PCL surgery, you will require a longer graft, which is very important because the intra-articular length of the PCL is in excess of 38 millimeters. So a smaller length graft will not suffice. You need a graft that will pass with ease because you have to negotiate the killer turn. So as to say, and that's another important point that we need to take into consideration. You need to have a graft that is going to be able to place a large amount of collagen within the footprint, which is again an important aspect. You need a graft that has to be very strong. It should not stretch out over a period of time and it should allow good strong fixation, which is also very important. And last but not the least, you need the graft to allow you a double burden construct, if at all you need to do one, and you need a graft which needs to have a large cross-sectional area. So the demands for a graft for the PCL are way far more than what the demands are for a graft for an ACL surgery, which is the more important point that we need to understand. So what are the different graft sources that we use for the PCL? The hamstrings are used widely. They will give you good length but they're unable to give you good diameter graft, which is very important if we need to have good cross-sectional area and if we need to place more collagen. And the plus point with a hamstrings graft is that you take out the PCL agonist, so that probably could go in its favor, but very frequently to get good quality collagen and good quantity collagen, we probably need to do a contralateral harvest as well, which may not be appealing for a lot of our patients. The bone tendon bone graft probably is best suited for the inlay technique, but it's a slightly shorter graft. And to try and get two bone plugs to negotiate these killer turns becomes a bit of a pain. And of course, you know, when you're doing such form of BTB surgery, it may not be the best way to sort of go around and you are risking weakening of the extensor apparatus. The quad tendon graft I feel is probably best suited in these instances, especially for PCL surgery, because as what has been demonstrated, the morbidity of harvest is minimum. It allows you a double bundle construct. It is long, it is strong, but the only disadvantage or the limitation would be to learn the harvest technique, which has been demonstrated very elegantly in the first talk. So how do you harvest or how do you prepare it? So that's a quad tendon graft that has been harvested along with a bone plug. You need the length of the bone plug to be about 30 millimeters, which is what I choose. You make three holes and pass three number five Tychron sutures. I would then go ahead and split the quad tendon graft straight down into two limbs. Normally would like to take 60% on one side and 40% on the other side, take some strong number two suture make whip stitches to a distance of about 30 millimeters on both sides, size them, and this is how I would then prepare a double bundle quad construct. So as you can see here, my bone plug is almost about 11 millimeters, which allows me 
to have a thick, robust graph, which is going to allow me to do a double bundle as well as which is going to give me a good construct. So here we are pulling the two bundles of my quad tendon graft in the two sockets that we've drilled. It's important to respect the fiber orientation at this instance. You want to have the AL fibers running on top of the PM fibers. And last but not the least, you want to first go ahead and fix your bone plug in the tibial tunnel. This is looking at it from a posterior lateral portal. I want to see the tip of my guide wire come out and my bone block should be flush to the mouth of the tunnel posteriorly where I can very nicely put in a screw and then this is what my final construct should be. So that's a concomitant ACL PCL reconstruction and what I've just demonstrated here is to how we will go ahead and construction. The role of using the quad tendon aut uh, autograft and the allograft has been well described. The Achilles allograft, which seems to be the more popular for doing a PCL surgery, is comparable to that of a quad autograft. And another study which looked at a comparative prospective study in which they compared double bundle quad graft in one group to a semi plus a quad in the other group showed that the quad double bundle is has equivocal results. The group from Taiwan probably popularized the role of quad tendon graft in PCL surgery way back in 2000. And they first described their technique initially for the same. And then later on, they went and published that they had good outcomes when they compared their technique with a quad tendon graft with that of a four strand hamstring graft as well with similar outcomes as regards IKDC, thigh girth, stability, as well as Tegner score. They came back later uh, after about four years and published a long-term follow-up on the same. But now they found that the same group which was comparable two years ago was now showing better results statistically in the quad tendon bone graft with lesser thigh wasting, better stability, the hamstrings graft, hamstrings knee, tended to get more lax over a period of time and they had better IKDC scores. A recent update published about two years ago, basically based on graph considerations in PCL surgery, also demonstrated the same. They concluded that though the Achilles tendon allograft remains to be the graft of choice while dealing with PCL tears, in countries which don't have good access to allografts, the quad tendon with both autograft was probably the most favored outcome. So to conclude, I think it's important to understand that choice of graft plays a huge role, especially when we're looking at PCL surgery. You need your graft to be long, strong, and durable. It needs to have good cross-sectional area. Hamstrings graft do have a concern with late laxity and the possibility of doing a double bundle becomes a huge advantage when we are looking at the same. So this is in a brief nutshell as to what the PCL has to offer us. And um, Parag, you have any questions on your end from the participants and the attendees? Yes. And if Aru has any questions, please do come forward. So that was an excellent talk, Sachin. You know, very well, you've covered the role of uh, quadriception graph for PCL. The, the question which has uh, come is that, uh, do you always do a double bundle uh, uh, two tunnel double bundle PCL, like on the femoral side, you put two tunnels, or it depends on the situation. So uh, I think uh, it depends upon the indication, Parak. So if we have uh, someone who's got an isolated grade three PCL or a grade three PCL with a postlateral corner tear, then I would like to do a double bundle. For someone who's got an MCL with a PCL or someone who's got a knee dislocation with ACL PCL. I would probably just do a single bundle PCL in those particular patients. And your bone plug always goes in the tibial side. Yeah, my bone plug is always to. Okay. Any Aru, you have a question? Yeah. Uh, yes, Aru. Excellent talk. Have you used peroneus longus for your PCLs? I think we have lost the first sir, for a moment. Yeah, so the, the question is on peroneus longus. So can I ask? Uh, He's back. Doctor, yeah. 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 Sachin, you got the question? No, no, I didn't get the question. Sorry. 
Or you can ask again. Yeah, Sachin, I mean, an excellent talk as usual. And I've used Perun is longest for a PC. You have a good lab, you can have a good lab. Have a good lab. Have a good lab. So, yeah, so um, Aru, I think the answer to that is that I have used uh, a triple strand, sort of a three folded Peronius longest as an all inside technique for the PCL. It seems to be promising, but I don't think that's going to be my first graph choice uh, if I have to do a PCL reconstruction. If I'm forced to use it because you know there's not much availability of graphs in a multi-lake, I may be using it, but that probably would not be my first choice of graph. Uh, so Dr. Hoser and Dr. Finch, do you have any thoughts on the Peronius longus, Dr. Hoser? No, I've, I've heard about it and I've read about it, but I've never done it. Yeah. I think two laptops are together and it's that's why we have a having a echo. Okay. I've I have no clinical experience with it. Any other questions for Sachin? Parag, there is uh, another question that's uh, come up here. Yeah. Uh, the question that's uh, come up uh, on the on the chat is that um, I get to uh, Dr. Fink and Dr. Hoser, and the question is that um, when what is the learning? Well, I think we're getting an echo there. Yeah. So uh, yeah, what is the learning curve for performing a minimal invasive harvest? So how many cases do you need to do confidently before you know, you're able to do this minimal invasive harvest technique? I think the most important is to make a long, when you start using this instrumentation, you should use a long vertical incision, a normal incision, and then see what you're doing with the instruments. And then you, when you're comfortable with the instruments, then it's very, very easy to do. Okay. But you have to see first. Okay. Uh, I think it will be nice if you go back to the headset. Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. So I think probably the uh, uh, Christian Hoser's phone was uh, giving some feedback maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any more questions uh, from Nilesh, Anshu, anybody? If not, I think then we'll go to the next talk uh, in which Dr. Christian Fink will discuss how he uses the quad tendon graft in an MPFL reconstruction. Just one second. Okay. Okay, so these are my conflict of interest again. Well, many reconstruction techniques have been published and uh, at least in Europe uh, it was predominantly with uh, using hamstrings with uh, different fixation techniques and then in uh, 2012 this paper by uh, Jay Sa really showed that despite giving some really good clinical results we, we have seen some significant uh, complications in this in this series. And the complications were associated uh, with this procedure were like uh, patella fractures due to implants and then uh, stiffness due to a very stiff construct. And I, for the first time in 2008, I was on a conference in Macedonia and I saw this presentation by Matthias Veselko from Slovenia, and he presented this uh, quadriceps tendon technique with the strip of quadriceps tendon. And uh, this was very intriguing to me because, uh, as I said, the construct looks more like an MPFL when you look at it anatomically. So the flat strip of quad tendon was really very similar. And during this time, we were just working on developing this instrumentation for uh, for the uh, ACL and PCL harvest. And uh, I, all basically we had to do is just make a, make a knife that is a little bit thinner, but use the, the same instrumentation, but with a little bit thinner strip of quad tendon. And then of course, I went to the literature when I came home and I looked at it and so this was, this has been published before by, by, by Rob Steenson from the US. And I think it has a really 
big uh, publication from coming directly from India. So it must be used very commonly in India. And this uh, was uh, published by, by Deepak uh, Goyal and they are using it quite successfully. And I mean, there's only to me for this technique, as I saw it was only this downside, especially in the, you have the female uh, with, uh, uh, with, with, with uh, soft tissue and maybe, maybe um, a little bit hyperextension uh, and they develop these huge scars. And if you harvest, if you have a scar like this compared to a hamstring, this is not really attractive. And again, we, we, we try to solve this problem with this instrumentation. So as, as I showed, we use the same, basically the same double knife, mostly it's a 12 millimeter uh, width. And then you use just a, a tendon separator and the thickness is three millimeters compared to the five millimeter or six millimeter for the ACL PCL. It's just a three millimeter strip of, strip of tendon. Then you use it longer, of course, you need about the 10 centimeter strip of tendon, which is fairly easy to get from the, from the rectus tendon. Then the graft is fixed, is fixed on the end with resorbable sutures. And then it's like for the, like for the uh, ACL graft, as we like to use a strip of periosteum, same way you use a strip of periosteum, you prepare down about one and a half centimeter on the lateral side and about half a centimeter on the medial side. And then you undermine the tissue on the medial side of the patella. It's very important to start centrally, don't start the harvesting procedure medially because then you have no tissue to suture it to. So start centrally and then you can diverge it underneath, underneath this uh, tendon sheet and fix it on the edge of the patella with two sutures. When we use the image intensifier as you're used to for positioning the femoral tunnel and you can fix it on the femur with a resorbable screw or like we like to use it in children, where we fix it with one bone anchor distal to the physis. In children, it's very important to, when you use the image intensifier to look in two planes because the physis is going upwards on the lateral view. So you might, you, it looks like you might be above the physis, but if you look at AP, you're always slightly distal to the physis. And this is important. And you should aim your anchor or your guide pin distally and we recommend use an anchor instead of a, a bone screw. So here is the video showing the whole procedure. You see it's a, again, it's a slightly transverse incision about three centimeters on the super medial part of the patella. We like to do an arthroscopy before to evaluate the, the, the gliding of a tendon. I like to use a super, Super lateral approach gives you a very nice view of the of the of the uh, patellofemoral joint, and you see the huge uh, dislocation to the lateral side. Then you make your incision. Pretty similar to your harvest of of the ACL PCL graft, where you make your incision more centrally. This is slightly super lateral. Exposure is very important to incise all the bursal tissue to give you a great exposure of the tendon. So as long as you see transverse fibers, you know it's not the quad tendon, it's always, it's, uh, it's a bursal sheet or it's some fascial sheet. sheet. Then again, you use the double knife. It's it's very important when you use this knife that you flex the knee oh. over 90 degrees so you've got good, te good tension mm. on the tendon. That is very important for the cutting procedure. So sometimes when you'd like to demonstrate this on a cadaver, which is cut on the femur, you have no tension and then it's difficult. When you use these knives, you really have to get tension on the quad tendon. And here you see the length for an MPFL, you like to have about 10 centimeters above the top of the patella. Nine is a minimum, depending on the size of the patient. When you use the tendon separator, and here it's the three millimeter separator in this case, otherwise it's the same, same instrumentation. It's been slided in from the side. 
where you can extend the knee a little bit. It's easier to insert it. And then when you start to cut, it's important that you have full tension on the, on the quad tendon again. Very important here to be central, maybe even slightly lateral. They get the higher, the highest tendon lengths, you get slightly lateral to the center and you go up all the way. And then final step is the tendon cutter. But again, as shown, you can do this procedure very well with an open incision without any special instrumentation. As I say, the only, the technique is exactly the same. The only downside is the cosmesis, but the clinical outcome, I think, as Deepak has shown, is excellent, even with the, with the big incision. And I think the advantage of the quad tendon uh, over the hamstrings is really that you have, you do not need any fixation here on the, on the patella. So here you see the absorbable sutures, and you see that it's, it's a nice, it's a nice flat, flat uh, graft, which is really approximating, approximating uh, the shape of, of a natural MPFL. Crack of sutures, resorbable, and then you measure the diameter. So you know your, your, your drill hole size, it's normally, it's about six to seven millimeter. Then you prepare the medial aspect of the patella and you prepare the graft down about one and a half centimeter. Be very careful not to strip it off. Here you prepare the medial side of the patella you, and you make a cut directly there and then you undermine the tissue. And it's a very, especially in the young patients, a very, very good, very good, uh, very good tissue. And it gives you enough strength to suture, to suture the, the, the graft on the edge there. When you find your plane to Diverge your graft. Here you see the undermining of the tissue, use a, an elevator. It's passed underneath, it's diverged 90 degrees and then passed underneath this tissue. It gives you a good fixation. Now it's fixed with two sutures here, here on the edge to really spread out the spread out the graft very widely on the super medial aspect of the patella. You can use two resorbable sutures because you get the very quick uh, graft healing. You have lots of lots of area and bony area to for the graft to heal to. So fixation is done on the patella. And you can see now you get a strong, strong fixation here. And then you do the same technique as you would do for hamstrings. You palpate, you palpate the adductor tubercle. You look with the image intensifier for the right position. Then you make your soft tissue tunnel and you drill hole. We always use an image intensifier for this procedure to look for the right position. And then you drill as again an adult, we use a screw or you can use a, just an anchor, an anchor fixation. If you do use an anchor, you have to make a slightly bigger incision in order to prepare your insertion site a little bit, uh, a little bit better. Here you see the right, the right entry point. You over drill it with the appropriate uh, reamer which is normally about six to seven millimeter. And then you pass 
a passing suture with a clamp. You retrieve your graft. Here you see the appropriate length. Now it's, it's important before you pull in the graft, if you make a small incision, put your knitting all wire, as you will see for the screw in the tunnel in order not to use, in order not to use, not to lose the hole. It's very difficult to find, especially before you pull the pin through, put your knitting all wire for the screw. Then you pull in the graft. Then you move the knee through full range of motion. It's very important if you feel, if you feel the, the MPFL tightening with flexion, your position on the femur may not be correct. This is, I think, the most important problem, so be very careful. The MPFL, MPFL if it's cor placed correctly, should rather loosen with flexion and not tighten with flexion. And then in about 30 degrees of flexion, and with just some al aligning the lateral border of the patella, not very hard pulling on the suture, you fix, you fix the graft. Okay, we looked at this biomechanically because people were always concerned that it's actually a weak link on graft fixation on the patella. So we looked at this and uh, when, we, when we look at uh, the natural MPFL, you see the natural MPFL is a very low stiffness and it has an ultimate load to failure of about 200 Newton. When you look at all the different grafts, you see, of course, semidinosus has a very much higher load to failure, but also has a much higher stiffness. So we looked at this, uh, took uh, 13 fresh frozen cadaver and uh, looked at the biomechanical characteristics of the natural MPFL. And then we reconstructed the MPFL with a strip of patella tendon and looked at it again. And what you could see when you compare the stiffness of the native uh, MPFL to the stiffness of the quad tendon graft, no significant difference. The maximum load to failure uh, only with the two sutures. And as I have to say, these are old cadavers. So in a young, uh, in a young patient, you have, uh, you have uh, much better tissue quality. So your maximum load to failure will be even higher. But even here, you see that they supersided the uh, maximum load to failure of natural MPFL What's interesting to see, and in the same laboratory, they did the same, uh, they did a same similar study using a hamstring graft. And what you could see that the stiffness of this graft is uh, about three times as high as uh, the stiffness of the quad tendon graft and also respectively of the stiffness of the nat native uh, uh, MPFL. This is just a small series. We published a bigger series just recently. It's just a small series of our clinical results. 23 patients had surgery was the, well, one of the first consecutive series, 20, uh, 24 months follow-up. You see clinical results. I think what we can say clinical results about the same to the published literature with the, with, with the hamstrings. But what we do see is we see a lower complication rate compared to what has been published with the, with the hamstring with respect of having no risk of patella fracture and having less risk of uh, stiffness and flash contracture as it looks like in the CVS over the years. So in conclusion, I think uh, quad tendon is a very good alternative to the most commonly used hamstrings. Maybe in India it's different since this technique came from India. Maybe quad tendon is, much, is used much more frequently in India. I, I don't know, but you may tell me. Uh, we are very happy that the quad tendon avoids any tunnel screw and anchors in the patella. I think this is the biggest risk and uh, we have seen some bad fractures there. And the most important thing for us is you can safely use it in children, but just uh, don't use a screw on the, on the femur. It's also good to always have a second choice because if something fails, you need a revision graft. So it's always good if you have bone tunnel, existing bone tunnels in the patella, it's a good solution. But uh, so it's always good to have a, to have a a second choice for this. It may have some biomechanical advantage. Uh, of course, the clinical merit of quatin has been proven with longer follow-up. Uh, but I think, uh, as I said, Deepak Uyal has actually had quite a long, quite a large series over many years. So I think you have proven that 
the open technique works. And I think the minimal invasive technique just have the cosmetic, cosmetic advantages, but uh, clinically, I think there shouldn't be any, any difference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fink, for this uh, lovely presentation. Couple of questions coming through. I know Dr. Anshu has a question, but I'll start off with the first question. Uh, you showed in your technique that you used resorbable sutures and not non-resorbable sutures. Why is that? Uh, well, I, we used initially, we used non-resorbable sutures. Uh, actually, one reason is the knot can be a little bit protruding. If you have a big knot right on the edge of the patella, if you have a skinny patient, you can feel the knot. And uh, I do not think from the healing part, as we see clinically, you do not need it because it will heal very quickly. And I think you do not need it. But the major reason was to have a smaller knot and not a knot that's persisting there. Okay, there's another question for uh, Dr. Christian Hoser. And his, uh, the question for him is that, uh, can you please elaborate how you use suspensory fixation device with the quad tendon that you've harvested? So how do you prepare the suspensory device on the bone plug? We use uh, a number two fiber wire in one or two, through one, or, in a double loop, through one or two holes in the bone plug. So if the bone plug is uh, very robust, then one hole is good, makes it a little bit more difficult to pass the second uh, stitch fiber wire, the so second loop through it. If uh, the bone plug is a little bit more delicate, then you make a, and this is, I think, we think important, a 1.5 millimeter hole. Don't make it two millimeter hole. Make it a 1.5 millimeter hole in the bone plug. Then you are safe, we will not weaken the bone plug massively. And then if you pull it in, maybe that's also something different than to a soft tissue graft. In a soft tissue graft, you have a strong boy on the lateral side of the femur to pull it in. And you will be, always be able to pull it in. If you have a bone plug, you need to, as you mentioned with the PCL, you need to navigate it around or through the tunnels. And it's more a question of be aware where it can be stuck and push it with your probe as opposed to just pull it in like very hard. So how do you prepare or how do you decide the length of the loop? So that's the other question that's coming. Yeah. Yeah. Are we you have... using a fixed uh, suspensory device? Are you using an adjustable suspensory device? We... And in the slide that you showed, you prepare your own suspensory device. So how do you... Uh, so... <laughs> so the suspensory device is uh, a commercially available uh, endo button of any prevent from any company. And then we connect the uh, endo button to the bone plug with a number two fiber wire. And we are believers in uh, non-adjustable looping. So you the... get rid of the, so you read, get rid of the, uh, so the, the loop that comes with the device. Yeah, we buy one chopped. without the loop. We buy oh, okay. one without the okay. loop. Yeah. Okay. We're, not, we're not rich enough to. Uh -huh. cut, cut away this, this expensive uh, prefabricated loop. <laughs> Another question that's come up several times is that, uh, you know, you've made your incision, you've harvested the quad tendon. How do you close the most proximal part? Because, yeah. you know, you're looking through a transverse incision, the proximal part is far away. How do you actually see it? How do you close it? What's the trick? Now, seeing is not the problem. If you lift up with a long Langenbrex retractor, really uh, 10, 12 centimeters long, seeing is not the problem. And then you have to uh, bring out the shoulder surgeon in yourself and bringing a sliding uh, knot, then you can close it. Um, you can also use the endoscope to visualize it and you can do it uh, like a shoulder surgeon and, and make knots up there, uh, sort of uh, endoscopically, endoscopically supported. Um, and that's not very difficult for people that are used to doing this. Have you seen any difference in the tunnel dilatation rates if you've used a suspensory device or a screw on the bone plug side? Um, on the bone plug side, you do not get any tunnel enlargement. Okay. Um, the bone plug heals in there within four weeks. But we do use... Uh, uh, soft tissue quadriceps tendon as well. And maybe I hand over to Christian Fink about the tunnel widening with quadriceps tendon. 
actually, we looked into this uh, recently by doing some sequential MRIs comparing bone block and no bone block, because it's always a question in the primary, do you need the bone block? And uh, what, you can, what you can see, I think bone block is the gold standard. It gives you the quickest bone tendon healing. There's no doubt about this. But if you, if you use it with this periosteum flap, we haven't certainly not seen any tunnel enlargement. So this, this was the big, maybe the, the, healing, the healing procedure, the healing, bone, bone healing is certainly slightly slower than with the bone block. But uh, we have not experienced any any tunnel enlargement like we used to see it from the hamstring graft. And I think another advantage here, if you use a squared tunnel, which gives you more tendon bone contact, this is maybe the biological advantage of, of this. This is even even better. But I think is a, these are minor things we, are, we we talk about. But but uh, the tunnel enlargement has not been the problem we have experienced with hamstrings before. Okay. So Arubugam, I think uh, you're a you're a great BTB uh, harvester and user. Probably you should switch to rectangular tunnels for your femoral side. That mm. would be uh, definitely beneficial because you do a lot of BTB, isn't it? It is definitely. Uh, I will uh, try. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah, actually, sure, yeah. Yeah, actually sure a, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, yeah. Sorry, actually, we we started this technique with rectangular bone tunnels. We started for BTB. Because it, it was to me, it was always I was I liked the graft, but the harvest side mobility was always a concern of me. So I thought, just harvest a smaller bone block, and uh, I, I looked at this patella tendon once, and and I just saw said thought we are just using this huge bone block to fill up a round tunnel. It has nothing to do with tendon insertion. So make the bone blocks smaller and just make make the tunnel fitting the tendon then rather the opposite. So this was actually we completely started with the rectangular with the patella tendon and then later on move to the quad tendon. Okay, Anshu, you have a question? You want to yeah, so uh, my question is for Dr. Fink. So your, your patient with an ACL tear is ready, all prepped up for surgery. You have scrubbed up and come and you realize that your cord harvester is just not there. It's not to be found. So where would your allegiance lie? Would you go ahead and do a mini open cord harvest or would you switch to a hamstring harvest? And the patient is not cosmesis sensitive. <laughs> I would, I would definitely be if I have the page. I would not rely on the instrumentation. I would definitely do an open harvest. I would not hesitate to go for the same graft, and we can, we can do this. And I think it should not be the the instruments should not make your choice of the graft. So they're just a helper, but they are not absolutely necessary. So I think the graft makes a difference. I would not, if I have decided for a quad tendon graft. I would not change my my procedure just because not having the instrumentation. Lovely. So uh, we have, uh, I think, another couple of more questions. Um, how do you choose the screw diameter for a femur or tibia of the quad tendon? Does it change if you decide to use a metal screw or a peak or the bio or a bio screw? How do you choose a screw diameter? No, I'm not, I'm not a fan of oversizing. So as I said, I do not use a screw or we both do not use a screw in particularly. We use a screw on the tibia. We are not oversizing it. We are using it in the same size as the tunnel diameter, but we always do a hybrid fixation. So we always use a bone bridge fixation or a post fixation additionally to the screws. You're not rely on pure screw fixation, but I do not like oversizing, oversizing screws. It's always Regardless of the screw, it's always the same diameter as the tunnel. So uh, there's a question on PCL, which is uh, when you're preparing a double bundle, do you make a coronal or a sagittal incision in the quads? So I prefer to do a coronal incision. Uh, any preference from uh, both of you, whether you like to sort of split the quad tendon in the coronal plane or in the sagittal plane? I, I have to say that we use the quad tendon differently to you. Okay. We use we use it we use the bone block on the femur. We use a flat bone block, so we use a we use a, a flat bone block. I like to use the bone block for the quad for the PCL because it gives you some additional length. But we use a flat bone block, uh, which gives you a little bit covers a little bit more of the insertion on on the femur and the round tunnel on the tibia. So our bone block is always on the femur, because it's flat. It's easier to get it around the corner through a round tunnel. And then we fix the same, same fixation with the, with the button on the femur. So I, I have to say, I haven't done a double bundle construct, but 
I like to, I like, I like it. I like the, I like your presentation. So maybe we change. <laughs> Uh, there's one more technical question that has come up is that we are making, uh, we're using the tendinous portion for a primary ACL on the tibia. So why do we need to make a rectangular slot on the tibial side? Why do we need to use the rasp? Why can we not just make a circular tunnel? And if you're making a rectangular rasp and when you drill two K wires to put the rasp in, is there a chance of causing a fracture because you're trying to bang it in? Yes, you're hitting some very good points. First of all, I think the advantage of a square tunnel on the tibia is not as big as on the femur. I think you can very well use a round tunnel on the tibia and then you put the screw in. I think you, you, you get this very similar insertion side. The only advantage here is uh, that you have, again, if you use a square tunnel, you have more bone tendon contact which is probably gives you a better healing as we know from some experimental studies. If you have a more, more tendon contact and you have a lower diffusion length, you get, you get a quicker healing. But otherwise, you can very safely drill a round tunnel. The risk of fracture, absolutely. You have to be very careful if you, if you use a dilator on the tibia because the bone hardens when, it, when you get proximal to the joint. So it hardens getting toward the eminence. So you have to be really careful. It's not like the classic orthopedic force. You should be very gentle when you put up your, 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 your dilator. You'd be very careful that you have the right orientation, that you're not getting oblique to, to your prior drills. So if you do this, it's more gentle. And uh, I will say, yeah, on the TB, you can very safely use a round tunnel. If you have a very tight notch, we think that the square tunnel is, is, gives you an advantage. Okay. Uh, any questions from the panel? Uh, anyone has any more questions? Christian, you want to add a comment on that? Do you want uh, to add may I ask you to repeat the question, please? I... Yeah, the, the only concern was that I think this has come up a couple of times. Is there any disadvantage of using a round tunnel with a rectangular graft? So I don't have the rasp to make a rectangular tunnel, but I've harvested a quad tendon with a bone plug. Yes. What happens if I put it in a round tunnel? Should I then be using a screw or can I still use a suspensory well, device? I, I'm, I may tell you a secret, Sachin. If I harvest the bone plug on the femur yeah. and I see that I've harvested not the perfectly small in-depth bone plug, which happens, so it would be a lot of work for the assistant to, to nibble away the bone, I may say to the nurse, today we drill it round on the femur. <laughs> so <laughs> I think this is with the bone plug on the femur, it's not a problem of, of any uh, uh, volume, meaning you, you create a defect or so. But what we do then when we pull in the graft, you very carefully look that the rotation of the graft is similar to what we would do with rectangular tunnels, that it really rotates in and you can do that with a bone plug. You can help the graft rotate in correctly uh, as opposed to with a semitendinosus, you cannot do that. I've not found an option to really be able to rotate the graft while pulling. When you're in 90 degrees, you should rotate it by some 90. If you're in 90 degrees of knee flexion, you should rotate the graft. Uh, so you can, you can do a round tunnel with a round quad tendon bone plug as well. Okay. So um, uh, we have a very... Uh sort of prolific uh, BTB user on our panel. That's uh, Dr. Arumugam. So Aru, do you also rotate your graft uh, when you use a BTB and you, you fixed it? Do you rotate your graft before fixing it on the tibia? No, uh, not usually, unless you end up with a graft tunnel length mismatch, then I rotate at the tibial layer to shorten the graft. Otherwise, I don't rotate um, the graft. Okay, one more technical question. What is the minimum and maximum dimension of the rectangular bone plug that we should do? Yeah, our width, instrument. Width, height, and length. So the length is, you, I think the maximum should be less than 20 millimeters. Don't cut into the proximal patella more than 20 millimeters. You, you don't need to, and, and you weaken the patella. Uh, the width, 10 millimeters in width is possible. 
then it depends on the size of the patient. So obviously it's, it's something that uh, has to be in, in accordance with the size of the patient. And the width is 11, maybe 12 is something that is uh, the limit to the, to the upper, the upper limit of a width of a, a bone plug, also depending on the size of the patella. But that's what is used in our hands. For the, for the, uh, the knife using for the, used for the tendon, it's a 12 millimeter knife. That's the biggest one that we have. Okay, perfect. Uh, any more questions, any comments? Yeah, Parag? So, uh, no more questions, but I think this was an uh, excellent uh, webinar. We want to uh, thank uh, both the Christians. Yeah, you know, you did a great job. And uh, I think the quadriceps is a, a good tendon to fall back on. And you very eloquently showed us uh, you know, the nuances of using the quadriceps tendon. Uh, so my question, last question to both of you is, do you always use a quadriceps tendon in a primary ACL reconstruction or is it another tendon you fall back on? So in your primary ACL reconstructions. Are you 100% quad tendon? No, not 100%. As you say, I, I, it, it's really, I think ACL surgery is an individualized surgery and it's never, it should never be 100%. There are always reasons why you shouldn't do it. So what's your choice? Do. Second was the option then. What, what are your other it's, draft options? It's okay. So, so, my, so if the patient comes in and has an ACL surgery on the other side, for example, he has a hamstring five years ago, is perfectly happy. I would never use a different graft. I would give him exactly the same graft. So I don't like to change graft. Uh, if, if you have a professional soccer player who come in, they ask for a patella tendon because everybody wants a patella tendon, the coach, everybody, I would not argue. I think there's no reason to me not to do a patella tendon, especially in these high level athletes. I think it's perfect. He does not have to kneel. Maybe if he's got some patella pain, it's a little harder. But he will, it's a good graft, and I would, I would. So, so it's definitely there are reasons why you why you would do this. There are some clear reasons for us for quad tendon. It's a medial instability. If somebody has an additional medial instability, we do not like to harvest the hamstrings, for example. It's clear if somebody has a kneeling occupation, I would not use a patella tendon. Uh, if somebody has to kneel on it, in a professional climber, for example professional indoor climber, I would not use the hamstrings because they renew the hamstrings much more than the, the, the extensors. So, so there are some special reasons, but generally I think as you saw from our data, if sports activity is not the big issue and they are less active and lower activity levels, I think you can use any graft. You're very safe with hamstrings. Yeah. When it comes to higher activity, then I think we have to be careful. So Dr. Hoser, any closing comments from you? So, and then we close with few on. I have one more question. Okay, Sandeep, you can come with a question. Yeah. Yes, before we... uh, uh, a question to both of you. Have you ever had a premature amputation of quadriceps while harvesting? Okay. So a technical question again. What happens, or have you had a premature amputation of your graft? And of if course. it does, what of happens course. next? Of course. Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, some people, some surgeons get louder and some surgeons get very uh, calm in this situation. Yeah, we had that. Um, the dangerous part is when you slide in the tendon cutter. When you slide in the tendon cutter, you have to extend the leg a little bit so that the tendon tension is reduced and you can slide it up because the, the lower part is obviously sharp. And if you have too much tension, then you can cut into your tendon and then you have a premature amputation. Um, and then we did, I think, se semitendinosus in the few cases. Um, and um, you're safe with a the semi then. It's a little bit harder to explain to the patient after surgery though. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I think uh, we'd like to thank, uh, you know, both our speakers today. They've been absolutely excellent. And uh, I think they had a large uh, volume of knowledge to share for all of us. Uh, I think to try and get these two giants of quad tendon on the same platform was a giant task, but uh, just one phone call. And uh, it was absolutely a quick yes from both of them. Probably uh, it's, it's very heartening to know that we have uh, 4,000 surgeons uh, who have attended this webinar. 
and uh, we'll, we'll know the real numbers on YouTube afterwards. But uh, anywhere in excess of 4,000 has been a viewership, which uh, goes to show the kind of popularity that both of you gentlemen do enjoy. So thank you very much from the Pune Ni course organizing team uh, to both of you, Professor Fink and Dr. Hoser, as well as all our attendees and Dr. Ashok Sham of IORG for hosting it up and follow us all our surgeons. Uh, we're back next Saturday at 7 p.m. We won't make a mistake, 7 p.m. India time. And we have uh, our magician, Dr. Ronald von Hirwarden, who is no stranger to all of us in India. And he's going to be taking a two hour masterclass on advanced planning in complex osteotomies, slope corrections in ligament laxities, rotational osteotomies for axial plane deformities, and intraarticular osteotomies for malunited tibial fractures. So do join us next Saturday, 7 p.m. We won't make a mistake, as I said, and we'll hope to have you join us with uh, none other than our very good friend, Ronald Hirwarden, who is probably the magician of the osteotomies. And thank you once again, uh, Professor Fink and uh, Dr. Hoser. And over to you, Parak, to make last closing comments uh, before this uh, very successful webinar closes. I think it uh, was excellent, a lot of uh, uh, learning. And even though we kind of delayed by an hour, uh, we have still So Parag, have we lost you there? Yeah, I think we lost you. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah so, uh, so we just lost Parag there. So, uh, so I apologize on his behalf. And uh, thank you so very much for to all of you to join us today. Thank you and hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.